Hi, everybody. It's Adam with HeartValveSurgery.com, and this is a special surgeon question and answer session all about the treatment of bicuspid aortic valve disease, including non-invasive transcatheter aortic valve replacement. I am thrilled to be joined by Dr. Christopher Meta, who's one of the leading cardiac surgeons at Northwestern Medicine in Chicago, Illinois. Dr. Meta, thanks for being with us today. Hi, Adam. It's good to see you again. Yeah, so let's get started, Dr. Meta. For patients, family members, and friends who might be just learning about bicuspid aortic valve disease, can you explain what is a bicuspid aortic valve? So a bicuspid aortic valve has two cusps or two leaflets instead of the usual three. Approximately 1% of the population has a bicuspid aortic valve, uh, and there are three um, heart problems that could potentially be associated with a bicuspid aortic valve. So the first is a narrowing of the valve, also known as aortic stenosis, which is caused by accelerated calcification of the valve. So that's typically seen in, in patients uh, in their 50s and 60s. The second issue is aortic regurgitation, which is leakiness of the valve, which causes backward flow of blood into the heart. And the third is that uh, bicuspid aortic valves are very commonly associated with aortic aneurysms, which are um, enlargements or dilations of the aorta. That puts patients at risk for aortic dissection or aortic rupture, two life-threatening diseases. Dr. Meta, with 1% of the population potentially having a bicuspid aortic valve, I'm sure patients are wondering, what are the symptoms of this disease and what are its causes? Uh, bicuspid aortic valve is a congenital condition, meaning you have it uh, since the time you're born. Um, and the symptoms that are associated with aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation, those two valve problems I discussed, uh, are commonly chest pain, shortness of breath, lightheadedness, fainting spells, and in severe situations, both conditions can lead to what's called heart failure or inadequate ability of the heart to pump blood forward effectively. Now, aortic aneurysms are commonly asymptomatic, meaning that people don't really feel symptoms of the aneurysm until it gets really big. And then in those cases, sometimes it can cause chest pain. Dr. Meta, given the seriousness of this disease, I understand that Northwestern Medicine has taken a very unique approach to managing and treating bicuspid aortic valves. Can you help us understand that? When we identify patients who have bicuspid aortic valves, they're lifelong patients in our program. And what that means is that we keep close tabs on them with echocardiograms, CT scan imaging, MRI imaging, to make sure that we really catch when their valve disease or their aneurysm gets to a point that uh, we need to intervene either by surgery or um, non-invasive uh, transcatheter techniques. Dr. Meta, I want to press pause right here because you brought up the timing of treatment for bicuspid aortic valve. I'm curious to know, and I'm sure the patients are, when is the right time to intervene with treatment? So the right time to intervene is when a patient develops symptoms associated with either aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation. So that's typically when the aortic stenosis becomes severe or the aortic regurgitation becomes severe, or when the aortic aneurysm reaches a size threshold that puts the patient at risk for developing an aortic dissection or rupture. And that's typically between five and 5.5 centimeters. Dr. Maid, I'm really curious, once you and your colleagues determine it's time for an intervention on a patient with a bicuspid aortic valve, what are the different types of treatment approaches you might use? So patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis that's associated with the bicuspid valve are treated with two mainstays of therapy, either surgical aortic valve replacement or transcatheter aortic valve replacement, or TAVR, which is a novel, more minimally invasive way of, of treating aortic stenosis. Now, patients who develop severe symptomatic aortic regurgitation are treated with surgery, either by aortic replacement or, in some cases, by aortic repair, in which we preserve the native leaflets of your own valve and we're able to repair it to make it a long-term durable option. Patients with aneurysms are treated with surgery as well. Dr. Meta, one of the big questions I have from patients is, how does the TAVR stay implanted in the aortic valve position? So 
The transcatheter aortic valve replacement is performed by snaking a wire through an artery. It's typically the artery in your groin, the femoral artery. And this wire is brought around to the aortic valve. Now we see this under live x-ray where the wire is going. And then a catheter with the valve is placed over the wire and brought around to the aortic valve. Now there are two types of TAVR valves. One is a balloon expandable and one is a self-expanding. Um, and both valves are used uh, in the position of the previous aortic valve and essentially pushes the old leaflets out of the way and puts the new valve in there. So once the valve is deployed, it actually anchors to the calcium of the leaflets that are already there and stays in place. Dr. Mehta, can you talk about the criteria that you and the Northwestern Medicine team use to evaluate a SAVR versus a TAVR for a bicuspid aortic valve patient? First thing I would emphasize is that no two patients with bicuspid aortic valve disease are the same. Some patients are better suited for surgery. Some patients are better suited for transcatheter or aortic valve replacement or TAVR. Now we look at a lot of different criteria in a multidisciplinary heart valve team meeting in order to see which is better for a particular patient. And those criteria include age, uh, the morphology or sort of the um, type of bicuspid aortic valve a patient has, the location and the degree of calcification that they may have, which is causing the aortic stenosis, um, any associated aneurysms or other pathology that may exist. Um, and finally, we look at the patient um, overall. What are their comorbidities um, or other medical problems that they have? Uh, and what are the patient's um, social, cultural, and religious preferences? And all of that goes together um, in making our consensus treatment recommendation. Dr. Meta, can you talk about the outcomes that you're seeing there for patients with bicuspid aortic valves who are having both surgical and transcatheter aortic valve replacement? One important thing to note is that surgical aortic valve replacement for patients with trileaflet or bicuspid aortic valves has been performed for over 60 years. So we have a lot of long-term data on uh, how durable those valves are. And you know, we know that we can perform a surgical aortic valve replacement with low risk in patients with bicuspid aortic valve disease. Now, transcatheter aortic valve replacement as a technology has only been around about a decade. And in patients with bicuspid aortic valve disease, we've only been using it for even a few years only. So there's still a lot to learn about who those particular patients are that benefit from TAVR and have a bicuspid aortic valve. Dr. Mayday, it's great that you and your team there are looking really closely at the utility of TAVR for bicuspid aortic valve patients. And can you shed some light? Are there any clinical trials happening right now specific to BAV and TAVR? The major landmark clinical trials that allowed TAVR to be approved for aortic stenosis in low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk patients uh, did not include bicuspid aortic valve patients. That's a very specific patient population. Now, what we do have is observational data, in other words, real world data of patients with bicuspid aortic stenosis who have received TAVR. Uh, and so we're still learning a lot about who those particular patients are with the bicuspid aortic valve who may benefit from TAVR. Dr. Maida, I've got to ask you, what is your number one piece of advice for a bicuspid aortic valve patient who's considering either a SAVR or a TAVR? My advice to patients with bicuspid aortic valve disease is to do your homework about heart valve programs. You want to be at a place that offers multidisciplinary care where you're not only being seen by a cardiologist, but also a surgeon and a whole team um, dedicated to your care. It never hurts to seek a second opinion if you're unsure. And again, I would emphasize that no two patients with bicuspid aortic valve are alike. Some are better suited with surgery and some are better suited with transcatheter. Dr. Maida, thanks for providing not just one, but several pieces of advice for patients, bicuspid aortic valve patients who are considering either SAVR or TAVR. And on that note, I wanna thank you so much for taking time away from your very busy practice there at Northwestern Medicine and educating the patients in our community at heartvalvesurgery.com. Thanks, Adam, I'm happy to help.
Hi, everybody. It's Adam. I hope you enjoyed that video. And don't forget, you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel. Watch the next two educational videos coming up on your screen or click the blue button to visit heartvalvesurgery.com.